Good morning. Thank you, Justin, for that very long reading of the passage. It's, it's not my mistake. It's the word of God, so <laughs> I didn't write it. Uh, but I did choose the passage. Standing up here, uh, you know, if the rapture were to happen, I think I'll be the first. I almost feel halfway, you know, up in the air here. All right. Uh, good morning. Can you all hear me? Can. Okay. Um, we will continue our study in the book of Daniel, and uh, we worked our way through chapter 8, and today, as is evident by the reading, we will be looking at chapter 9 of the book of Daniel. I'm not going to read uh, the entire passage once again. I hope you followed in the reading, so I'll be reading some scattered verses just for us to follow along in, um, in where we are in the text. You know, we all have heard of Muhammad Ali, who is a heavyweight boxing champion. And his name resonates with many things. Humility is not one of them. So Muhammad Ali was once flying in an airplane. Some of you may be familiar with the story. He was flying on an airplane. And uh, the pilot's voice came over the microphone and it said, everybody, please fasten your seat belts. And everybody complied except Ali. So the flight attendant walks over to him and she says to him, there is this uh, warning or there is this order to fasten your seat belts and would you please comply? Ali said in his own inimitable way, Superman don't need no seat belts. And the flight attendant did not miss a beat. She quipped right back and she said, Superman do not need no airplane either. <laughs> you know, Often, even as Christians, assuming ourselves to be super people, we often miss out on very essential things in our Christian lives. And you will understand very soon what I'm driving at right now with another illustration that I'm going to begin with. It's about a fifth grade boy who was uh, sitting in a church like this, and he listened to uh, a preacher preaching about persistent prayer. And the preacher was talking about how you need to be very persistent in your prayer. And that evening, he went back home and he was praying aloud, Tokyo, Tokyo, Tokyo. And the father, who was standing behind a slightly edge our door, overheard him. And the next morning, um, he came around breakfast time and he asked him, his son the question, Why were you chanting Tokyo, Tokyo, Tokyo? He said, Yesterday, in my class test, the question there was, What is the capital of Mexico? And I wrote Tokyo, and I was persistently praying that the Lord would somehow change New Mexico to Tokyo, <laughs> or Mexico City to Tokyo. You know, uh, it's just a farcical story about how people pray. But few aspects of the Christian life can cause Christians like you and I more guilt and more pain than a lack of personal prayer and private prayer. In fact, it is one discipline in our Christian life or in our lives together that brings us a lot of pain and grief because we don't keep up with it. And the struggle doesn't just exist for immature or weak Christians. Some of the finest Christians have struggled with prayer as well. Listen to the testimonies of three of some of the finest preachers that I know of. First one, Martin Lloyd-Jones. Listen to his testimony. He says, Everything we do in the Christian life is easier than prayer. Everything we do in the Christian life is easier than prayer. Alexander White said, There is nothing that we are so bad at all of our days as prayer. And finally, Thomas Shepard said, There are times in my life when I would rather die than pray. There are times in my life when I would rather die than pray. Now listen to these words. This is the final quote before I begin. Listen to these words from John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, which we are all familiar with. And this man is a fine preacher, and his knowledge of scriptures is amazing. And he says this, May I but speak my own experience. From that, tell you the difficulty of praying to God as I ought. It is enough to make you entertain strange thoughts of me. For as for, uh, for as for my heart, when I go to pray, I find it so reluctant to go to God. 
and when is when is with him so reluctant to stay with him that many times i'm forced in my prayers first to beg god that he would take my heart and set it on himself in christ and when it is there that he would keep it there in fact many times i know not what to pray for i'm so blind on how to pray i'm so ignorant only the spirit helps me in my infirmities now this is astonishingly honest and all of us i think can relate with john bunyan as he states this particular thing that he has difficulty in praying he has difficulty in concentrating in prayer in fact as a preacher i actually wish more people would relate to this i actually wish i would relate more to this because a lot of christians sadly do not even get to this struggle that john bunyan is talking about and there are this other set of christians who get into this prayer rut where it is very difficult for them to break out of this prayerless attitude or prayerlessness and i have some christians who have come and asked me this question or said this to me that since they don't know how to pray effectively or since they have not seen prayers being effective in their lives they don't want to pray anymore these are some of important questions and it ought to raise some of the very important questions in our christian lives number 1 how do i pray or better what are the marks of an effective prayer what are the marks of an effective prayer all these answers are found in daniel chapter 9 In fact many scholars and many preachers take this chapter to be a chapter on prophecy a very significant prophecy it is and i love that but in talking about this prophecy about the future of israel we ought not to miss out on the prayer and prophecy coming as a result of daniel's prayer so the entire chapter is about daniel's prayer and his confession and the prophecy comes as a result of daniel's prayer and we ought not to miss the entire chapter on prayer and prophecy is just an answer or an insight or a revelation to the confession that daniel makes about himself and about his people i urge you to read this chapter out aloud when you go back home and nothing i could say here will will convince you or will do justice to the power of these ancient words of prayer prayed by daniel but if you go home and read aloud a couple of times this particular prayer you will learn how to pray i will learn how to pray this is so powerful and the good news in this chapter is that the prayer of a righteous man the prayer of one righteous person the prayer of one righteous man or one righteous woman can change a church can change individuals can change societies can change the outcome of elections and even can change an entire nation as well that's the good news in daniel chapter 9 because the prayer the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much is what the bible says so today's passage will reveal to us two things that you and i need to know that you and i need to understand regarding the marks of an effective prayer very simply there are two marks of an effective prayer in this particular chapter in daniel daniel chapter 9 and i have the outline up here as usual this is i'm not sure why this is working but i got this up here um today's passage will reveal to us two things about the marks of an effective prayer so here is the outline please follow along this is a tough passage and i found it very difficult to outline as well but follow along in the outline as we go step by step and bear with me please this is a tough passage but i as we as we sit here in god's presence this morning with reverent reverent hearts for his word i hope the lord will speak to us each one of us in fact through this passage so in verses 1 through 14 you will see that prayer must be rooted in an understanding of god's character and his covenant promises prayer must be rooted in an understanding of god's character and his covenant promises a clear perception of who god is and his covenants with man will help you and i to pray effectively a clear perception of who god is and the covenants he has made with you and i through the bible will help you and i to pray effectively that's exactly the prayer of daniel and the basis of daniel's prayer daniel's prayer 
was a result of the knowledge of God's character that he had and the covenant promises that he has made in his word. And we see three things about Daniel's prayer here. Firstly, Daniel understood about Jerusalem and its restoration from scripture and turned to the Lord. He understood about Jerusalem's restoration, restoration and he turned to the Lord in prayer. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Look at the Bible, please, as I read those verses. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of the years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah, the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. What Daniel did in this particular chapter is dated to 538 BC, which is the first year of Darius the Mede, who had taken over as the king of Neo-Babylonia. He's, he's, a, he's a, a, a Medo-Persian king, but he had destroyed, uh, they had destroyed Neo-Babylonian empire, and he is now the king. And Daniel was brought to Babylon, if you remember, in 605 BC as probably a teenager. And when you look at the timeline, he is probably now over 85 years old. He knows he doesn't have much longer to live. And somehow in his possession came this scroll, the book of Jeremiah, the prophet. He says, the word of the Lord has spoken through Jeremiah. And as he was doing his daily devotions from the book of Jeremiah or the prophet Jeremiah, he comes to understand that the desolation, the time of desolation of Jerusalem, uh, the end of it is going to come near. God is going to restore his people back to the city of Jerusalem. And the timeline is 70 years. Now he starts doing the math and he finds out that from 605 BC till now, it's been 67 years. And now it's only a few years for Jerusalem and the people of God to be restored. I want to give you the specific timeline that Daniel here is talking about. Here's the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy as given to us in the book of Jeremiah. If you remember, there were three deportations by Nebuchadnezzar the Great. The first hit that Nebuchadnezzar did against Judah was in 605 BC. And that was the first uh, deportation. That's when the temple vessels were all taken back to Babylon. And then there was a second deportation in 597 BC. Then the third one came when the temple was destroyed in 586 BC. That's when Judah and Jerusalem completely fell. And that's when the temple was completely destroyed. And I know I'm blocking the view for some of you, but I can't help it. Uh, 586 BC. Now, since the desolation of Jerusalem is in view here... As he's mentioned very clearly in these verses, I think the 70-year timeline that the book of Daniel talks about is from 586 BC to 515 BC when the temple was completed. So that's the 70 years that Daniel here is mentioning and not from 605 BC to 536 BC when the temple construction began. Why do I say that? Because here it's very clearly talking about the desolations of Jerusalem coming to an end. And so we take 515 BC as the end reference point for those 70 years. That's what Daniel is talking about. And Jeremiah had received this revelation from God that God would restore his people to their land when they prayed to him wholeheartedly. If God's people would repent, if they would turn their hearts to God and pray to him wholeheartedly, God would restore his people back to the land. And this enormous scriptural knowledge that Daniel had forms the foundation of everything in his prayer. This knowledge of scripture, this understanding of what God's going to do from scripture, from the book of Jeremiah, uh, finds itself as the foundation to the prayer that Daniel was praying. Although things looked very bleak around, bleak around him, and it appeared impossible that the exile would end soon, Daniel found himself sturdy in the word of God and he believed in the word of God and on that basis he begins fasting intercession and praying to God what was the motivation of Daniel's earnest intercession here it is twofold number one it is the need of the hour number two he believed in the covenant promises of God and therefore he went to God in fasting and prayer 
Now, while abstract logic might ask a question like this, and I get this question asked by several people, if God has already promised, if God has already ordained something, why do we need to pray? Daniel doesn't ask all these questions. He simply prays because Daniel himself understood that God employs prayer as the means by which he is pleased to bring his word to fruition. He's pleased to bring his word to fulfillment. And so Daniel understood about Jerusalem's restoration from scripture and he turned to the Lord in prayer and fasting. Second thing about Daniel's prayer. Daniel confessed to God that the lack of covenant faithfulness brought Covenant curses upon his people. The lack of covenant faithfulness brought covenant curses upon his people. Verses 4 through 14. But let me just read for you four verses for us to understand the context. Verses 4, 5, 13, and 14. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled turning aside from your commandments and rules. Verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept already the calamity and has brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he has done, and we have not obeyed his voice. Listen to the sense of theology that Daniel is giving or portraying in his prayer. Daniel's prayer was dominated by a sense of the character of God. His understanding of how God works and has made covenants with the people of God in the Old Testament. He talks about God's righteousness. Now listen to this very carefully please. And listen to the understanding of Daniel about God's righteousness from the Old Testament. The righteousness of God is his absolute perfect integrity. It is his conformity to his own perfect glory. That is the righteousness of God. That is the perfect standard. In his relationships with people, this righteousness takes the form of covenant faithfulness. When God makes covenants with his people, his righteousness takes the form of covenant faithfulness. What do I mean by that? God has made a covenant with his people, the people of Israel. He promised to be their God and he took them as his people. And he also said this. He said, I made this covenant with you. If you respond in covenant faithfulness back in love to me and respond to my love, you will face blessings. But on the other hand, on the other hand, I also make one more promise to you. If you respond with ingratitude, disobedience, ungratefulness, then judgment will come upon you. Judgment will come upon you. And Daniel, in his prayer, lists out all these principles of the Old Testament. And all these principles of the Old Testament are underlying in Daniel's prayer. And that is how God dealt with the people in the Old Testament. It is significant for us to understand that Daniel uses the covenant name Yahweh in this particular chapter and not in any other chapter of the book. And it is very, very significant because God makes that covenant with his people and he's talking about those, uh, he's talking about God's covenantal basis and how he deals with people in that sense. In his long suffering, he sent out many prophets and he warned them about the calamity that would come upon them. But people went astray from him. But here, Daniel, in a very true sense of repentance, he's praying out and taking upon himself, although he was, the most, uh, he was the most obedient of the Jews there, he is taking upon himself the sins of people. And he is ransacking most of the Old Testament vocabulary in his prayer and praying words like sin, rebellion, scattered, shame, guilt, and we have fallen away. And he is talking about the sin of Judah, and its consequences, and the consequences that they are rightly deserved at the hand of God. You know why? Because Daniel understood that along with covenant blessings, when you obey God, come covenant curses as well when you disobey God. And that's the theology of Daniel as he prayed to God. God has kept his promise. God has kept his promise in bringing these curses upon these people. Thirdly, Daniel appealed to God to defend his glorious name by restoring Jerusalem according to his word of promise. Verses 15 through 19. I'll just read verses 17, 18, and 19. Now therefore, 
O our God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his pleas for mercy and for your own sake, O Lord. Make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake. O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. As Daniel prayed this prayer, I find this very interesting that Daniel did not ask God to abandon his righteousness. He does not ask God to abandon his righteousness and stop punishing his people. Why does he not do that? Because the very hope of his people is God's righteousness. God's righteousness is the very hope of his people. And therefore, he goes back to the Exodus and almost in a sense of reminding God about how he acted for the glory of his name, he says, Lord, remember Exodus. At that time, for the glory of your name, because of your covenant faithfulness, you brought out the oppressed in your mercy and you destroyed the wicked. And would you do the same thing today? Not because of what we've done, not because we have a great name and we deserve it, but because of your covenant mercies, but because of who you are, because of your righteousness. And in all of this prayer can be summed up in one verse, in, one, in verse 18, when Daniel says, for we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy, but because of your great mercy. What a crucial insight that is in terms of prayer. Often when we go to God in prayer, when we have our quiet times right, when we have our personal evangelism right, when we have preaching right, or things that we do in church right, we often go to God with a sense as though we deserve to get answers from God. But Daniel here is praying that we come to you not because of our own righteousness, but we come to you because of your exceedingly great mercies. Daniel understood the heart of God and Daniel understood how it is to pray to God because he understood scripture very well. My question to you this morning as I ask myself this question is, are your prayers informed by scripture? Are your prayers informed by scripture? Are my prayers informed by scripture? You see, using God's word in prayer or scripture praying, as it is often called, gives us a divine familiarity to our words. And it earmarks us as servants who know the most powerful prayer book in the world, that is the Bible. Most saints in the Bible prayed this kind of a prayer. They prayed the word of God back to him. You think about Habakkuk. Habakkuk prayed the word of God back to him when the city or the nation was desolate. You think about David. David had a certain understanding of God, the right understanding of God, and he prayed about his nature back to him. For example, in Psalm 25, David says, Remember, O Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. According to your love, remember me for your good, O Lord. He is talking God's word back to him. Now we have prayer meetings. We have prayer meetings where usually the prayer requests are about healing, about a job, or about travel, or about things that are our needs. And there's nothing wrong with that. We ought to pray for one another. As a church, we ought to pray for each other as well. But when we examine scripture here closely, God's word reveals a deeper and more divinely inspired ways of praying for one another. For example, let me give you a couple of examples and I've not mastered this, I'm just trying it, I'm a novice at this. For example, if there's a need for finances in a particular family, now it's all right and in order to pray for finances because it's only God who can give us finances. But if you can remember one verse, something like as random as Proverbs 15, 17, where it says, better a meal of vegetables where there's love than a fattened calf where there's hatred. Now, how do you pray that back to God in this particular context when you're praying for finances? I think it would be invigorating to pray. Lord, financial blessing is not a focus here. But as this particular verse says, love is the focus. And so, even in our time of need, help us to love you 
Help us to love one another and help us to lean more on you and on one another as well as we go through this crucial time. It is invigorating. It makes a difference. That is praying scripture back to God. Now, husbands and wives, people who are married, we know that we try to change each other a lot. I try to change my wife. My wife tries to change me all the time. It happens in every home. But the fact of the matter is, when you nag and you scold, it makes things worse. I think the best way to go about is to go to the word of God and take the word of God and pray about your spouse from the word of God back to God who's given that particular word to us. For example, let me think about Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4. George Chen was talking about this a couple of months ago. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility... Consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, when I think about this, when I want to pray about this for my wife, that becomes very, very convicting. Because the fact of the matter is, I ought not to look at my own interests and selfish interests in particular to bring out a change in her, but I ought to look for her interests first. Now, that is invigorating prayer. Because we are looking at scripture and we are looking at it in the right sense that God has given it to us. Often, it's also good to substitute a particular name for a pronoun in the Bible and pray about somebody. For example, let me take Steve's example. I think the best passage I can think about here is Colossians chapter 1 verses 9 through 12. And if I'm praying about Steve... I can pray this way. I ask God to fill Steve with knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And I pray this in order that Steve may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work he does, being strengthened with all power so that he may have great endurance and patience and joyfully give thanks to the Father. Remember, God's word is alive. It is powerful. It's a double-edged sword. And prayers laced with the word of God not only bring about fundamental changes in us, they also bring about foundational, fundamental changes in the people that we pray for as well. That is the power of God's word. And weaving God's word into our prayers brings his purposes to the forefront of every one of our prayers. We are always in tune with his purposes when we pray such prayers. So my question this morning is, are your prayers informed by scripture? Are your prayers informed by scripture? In verses 1 through 14, we saw that prayer must be rooted in an understanding of God's character and his covenant promises. Then there's a second thing that you and I need to understand about effective prayer or the second mark of an effective prayer. And that is in verses 15 through 27. They say that prayer always grants a deeper appreciation of who God is and, he, and how he works in the world. Prayer always grants a deeper appreciation of who God is and how he works in the world. The Lord will give you a richer comprehension of himself and his ways and his acts in the world when you go to him with that kind of a prayer. We see that in Daniel's case. God gave Daniel a vision to extend his horizon and bring clarity about Israel's future. And we see two things about it very quickly. Firstly, Gabriel came with a vision as soon as Daniel began praying. Verses 20 through 23. And I'll read verses 21 and 22 here. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first came to me in a swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. Now verses 20 and 21, they tell us very clearly that this was an interrupted prayer. Because while Daniel was speaking to God and praying and confessing his sins and the sins of the nation, he received a messenger from heaven, Gabriel. Remember, Gabriel came to him in chapter 8 as well and gave him another vision about goat and ram. And here he comes with an answer to his prayer. He says, your prayer has been heard and an answer is on the way. 
Your prayer has been heard and an, and an answer is on the way. Verse 23 here tells me how God evaluated this particular man, Daniel. He calls him for you are highly esteemed, which can also be translated as you're precious, you're loved, which again tells me that God listens to our prayers because we are precious to him. We are loved by him and we are highly esteemed by him because of who we are in Christ Jesus and not because of our own righteousness. So Gabriel here came with a vision and be, as Daniel began praying. And secondly, Gabriel explained to Daniel several events on God's calendar up to the establishment of the Messianic kingdom. Verses 24 through 27. Now this is the answer to prayer. This is a prophecy. Now this is what some of you have been looking for till now. Uh, at least I know some people who are smiling at me right now. Uh, so we will look at God's plan and the timeline that God has given to us. Uh, not yet. That God has given to us. But let me, let me read for you verses 24 through 27. All of it. Uh, please follow along. 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. To finish the transgression. To put an end to sin. And to atone for iniquity. To bring in everlasting righteousness. To seal both vision and and prophet, and to anoint a most holy place. It ought to be a holy place. Some of your translations may have it as holy, but that's all right. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 62 weeks, it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. Look at how clear the prophecy is, and we'll see how each of this was fulfilled very clearly. Verse 26. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. John Walwood, who was uh, a one-time president of Dallas Seminary, a great prophecy scholar, says this. In the concluding four verses of Daniel 9, one of the most important prophecies of the Old Testament is contained. The prophecy as a whole is presented in verse 24, the first 69 sevens is described in verse 25. The events between 69th week and 70th week are detailed in verse 26. And then the final period of the 70th week is described in verse 27. See how clear he is about what this prophecy is about. Now let me explain to you what this prophecy is. Now the Hebrew word translated shabuim can be translated as weeks. And it literally means sevens. Now the Jews, if you remember, celebrated um, or observed a seven-year calendar, which is called a sabbatical year. Or a seven-day thing. On the seventh day, they would call it the Sabbath. Most scholars believe that the word here represents seven-year periods. It represents seven-year periods. And Daniel here had been thinking of God's program for Jerusalem in terms of years. He just talked about 70 years. And so we shouldn't be surprised that the interpre interpretation here contains years when it talks about sevens. Can we go to the next slide, please? So seven 70-year periods have been decreed is what the Bible says. So seven times 70 is 490 years. The Jews and Jerusalem will suffer under the hands of Gentiles for 490 years. Is that clear so far? The Jews and Jerusalem would suffer under the hands of Gentiles for 490 years. Now God had decreed these years and it is going to come to pass like everything else that God had decreed. So for 490 years, Jews and Jerusalem would suffer and suffer persecution under the hands of the Gentiles. The next one. In verse 24, God states the purpose for decreeing this particular thing. 
and for decreeing these 490 years he gives a sixfold purpose number one he says it will end the rebellion against him number two it will end human failure to obey god number three it will provide time for atonement that will cover human wickedness this is all in verse 24 number four it will inaugurate a new society in which righteousness will prevail number five it will bring in the fulfillment of the vision that god has for the whole earth and number six it will result in the anointing of the most holy place it is probably a reference to the new and the more glorious temple that will come so god has a sixfold purpose for these 490 years he says once these 490 years are done he has a sixfold purpose and all of these things are what verse 24 talks about now god has achieved some of these goals at least the third one in the death of the lord jesus christ because the third one says it will provide time for atonement that will cover human wickedness and in part he has achieved one and two as well but four five and six await a future fulfillment dwight pentecost another prophecy scholar says this by the time these 490 years run their course god will have completed six things for israel the first three have to do with sin and the second three have to do with the kingdom the basis for the first three was provided in the work of the work of christ on the cross but all six will be realized by israel at the second advent of the lord jesus christ the first three is about sin the second three are about kingdom the first three have their basis in the death of the lord jesus christ at his first coming and all the six will be realized by israel at his second advent at the second advent of the messiah or the lord jesus christ now this verse listen to me carefully please is a divine revelation that a definite time period has been ordained by god for jerusalem and the jews to suffer it is a definite time period that has been ordained by god when all that is necessary has been done god is going to restore his people back to the city from their bondage god is going to restore his people back to the city from their bondage next slide please the verse here talks about a decree that goes out and that is a starting point of 490 years a decree that goes out to rebuild jerusalem if you look at the Bible carefully, there are four decrees that went out. The first decree was in 538 BC when Cyrus gave the decree to rebuild the temple. Then there is a second one that was given by Darius the first. It was in 512 BC. He only confirmed what Cyrus had given in the first one. Then the third one was given by Artaxerxes in the year 457 BC. And the fourth one was Artaxerxes' decree authorizing Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem in 444 BC. These four decrees went out for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. But if you look at it, the first two decrees were about the rebuilding of the temple. The third degree provided permission for animal sacrifices. But the only clear reference to the rebuilding of Jerusalem was given by Artaxerxes to Nehemiah when Nehemiah went with all the provisions and when he went to build the city of Jerusalem or the walls of Jerusalem there was a great opposition for him so when talking about this 490 years we take the starting point of that year as 444 BC that's when the decree went out to rebuild Jerusalem 444 BC is a starting point of those 490 years next slide please now here is Daniel's 70 weeks and look at this carefully and follow along the argument please. 70 sevens plus 62 sevens comes to about 483 years, right? 483 years, which is 69 weeks and there's one more week, the seventh week, which is the 70th week of Daniel. So 69 weeks is divided into 49 years, which is seven and then 62 years, so all of it put together would come to 483 years. And Gabriel clearly predicted in that prophecy that after 483 years, Messiah will be suddenly cut off. After 483 years, from the starting point, 
the Messiah would be suddenly cut off. Now, detailed chronological studies have been done by several scholars about this. Uh, the one I like is a man by the name of Dr. Harold Honor, who did his PhD dissertation only on this particular thing about the chronological aspects in the life of Christ. Fantastic dissertation. I've read that, and you should, every Christian, I think, should take, uh, take a look at that. And most of my argument is based on his work. He calculates, when you look at the Persian calendar and move the details to a Jewish lunar calendar, which consisted of 360 years in a day, and then map it with a Julian calendar that we use, which is 365 days in a year. When you look at all of that, he says the starting point of those 490 years was on the 5th of March, 444 B.C., When you add up 483 years from the 5th of March to 444 BC in terms of the days, the calculation is given there, you end up on the 30th of March, 33 AD. You know what happened on the 30th of March, 33 AD? See how precise the prophecy is? God doesn't randomly give out numbers. He's very clear about what he's doing. He is clear, he's very clear about his ordaining of things. You know what happened on the 30th of March, 33 AD? The Lord Jesus Christ triumphantly entered Jerusalem. And after doing that, he went into the temple. He cleansed the temple. He presented himself as the great high priest who cleansed the temple, but he also presented himself as a lamb, the Passover lamb, who would be sacrificed. Four days later, on Friday, April the 3rd, 33 AD, he was crucified. Look at how clear the prophecy is. 483 years after which the Messiah will be cut off. Four days later, four days after those 483 years, the Messiah was cut off. He was killed. He was crucified. And then the prophecy uses another term, the prince who is to come. Look at your Bibles, please. The prince who is to come. He is different from the Messiah. The Messiah is also called the prince, but the prince who is to come is different from the Messiah. In fact, a legitimate Greek translation ought to go this way. The people of a ruler who will come and destroy the city. So it is not the ruler himself who is destroying the city, the people of a ruler who will come and destroy the city. He is talk it, uh, the Bible here is talking about what happened to Jerusalem in 70 AD, partially at least. When Titus Vespasian, that ruler, he came with his people and he completely decimated the city and destroyed the temple. We don't have the temple anymore because it was last destroyed by Titus. But the fact of the matter is, the Bible is only talking about what happened partially in this particular prophecy. And when you look at it, the Bible clearly says that this particular man, the prince of the people will make a covenant with Israel. But Titus made no such covenant with Israel in 70 AD or even before that. So what we need to look at here is that the Bible is talking about a future ruler who will come in a reorganized Roman Empire, so to speak, and he will rise up and he will be the little horn of Daniel chapter 7 that we studied and he will rise up and he will make a covenant with Israel sometime in the future. Which means it is very, very clear that there is a gap between the 69th week or 69 weeks and the 70th week. Otherwise, you cannot explain this prophecy. There ought to be a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. Now, that is very, very, uh, it, it has a lot of precedence in prophecy. For example, in Isaiah chapter 61, uh, a particular verse in Isaiah, verses 1 and 2, in fact, talk about the first and the second comings of the Lord Jesus Christ in two verses. And the Lord Jesus Christ applies to himself just the first part of it in his first coming when he goes to Nazareth and he talks about himself. You know, saying that the spirit of the Lord has come upon me and he's, an, he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor and all of that. So between two lines in a prophetic passage, there could be thousands of years of gap. And so between the 69th year and the 70th year, we know there's a gap of at least 2,000 years. And then the Bible here is very clear. Verse 27 is talking about the Antichrist who will rise to power, who will make a covenant with the nation of Israel, but he will break it right in the middle. 
as he proclaims himself to be God and he will set himself up as God in the temple which means that the temple will be rebuilt and so he will set himself up as God and the Bible calls it the abomination of desolation and our Lord Jesus Christ spoke about this in Matthew chapter 24 he said there is something called the abomination of desolation that is yet future that is going to come and so we are looking forward to somebody called the antichrist who in the end will be destroyed by the outpouring of God's wrath upon him by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at his second advent Daniel 12 talks about it it talks about a future stopping of Jewish sacrifices for 42 months before the return of the Messiah Revelation 13 describes a future ruler that is in harmony with what Gabriel talked about here and then Lord Jesus Christ warned about him in Matthew 24 and Paul talks about him in 2nd Thessalonians 2 as well he calls him a man of lawlessness the man of lawlessness and the Apostle John calls him the Antichrist he says many Antichrists have gone out into the world but there is this the Antichrist who will come all of these Bible writers refer to this man called the Antichrist who will come in future and he will set himself up as God and that is what the Bible is talking about in this particular passage the final refer the final verse here verse 27 is very very important to us because it gives us a prophetic timeline and it also tells us something that pre-tribulational rapture or the concept of rapture was not invented by Tim Lehi or Jerry Jenkins or Hall Lindsay it is straight out of here from the book of Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 Dwight Pentecost again articulated it so well he says the seven year period will begin after the rapture of the church the 70th seven will continue till the return of Jesus Christ to the earth because Jesus said this will be a time of great distress this period is often called tribulation is what he says this is the insight that Daniel gained through his prayer as he understood the word of God, as he understood the character of God, and he prayed to God, he got this insight as a result of his prayer. Have you gained any insights through your prayer? Have you gained any insights through your prayer life? True prayer always leads to a deeper insight of who God is and how he works in the world. Because prayer is a communication. It is a two-way communication. We speak to God. And we also wait to hear from God. To understand more about him. It is not simple knowledge about God. It is a deep insight in a kind of a relationship with him. In a fellowship with him. That is what prayer is. And when we pray, we enter a realm that goes beyond the physical. Because we are talking to God who is the creator of everything. Have you gained any insights through your prayer or through your prayer life? If you haven't, it is time to rethink your prayer. It is time for me to rethink my prayer as well. So what's the point of this morning's sermon about prayer? The whole chapter basically says, your prayer brings you a deeper understanding of God and his work when it is rooted in the word. Your prayer brings you a deeper understanding of God and his work when it is rooted in the word. An effective prayer is one that is based on God's character and enables you to understand him better. It enables you to understand him better. Two illustrations and I'll be through and thank you for your patience. Five college students were um, spending a day in London. This was in the Esther years. They were uh, not going for a cricket game or a movie. They wanted to go and hear Charles Spurgeon preach. They were spending a Sunday in London. And so... Uh, what they thought was they would go and attend his church and as they were entering the church there was nobody in the church there was one man who greeted them at the door and the man said let me take you for a tour around our church first of all I'd like to show you something called the heating point of our church and since it was summer uh, these people were not particularly interested to go near a heating point and so they said uh, well we you're not particularly interested but since you are a stranger and you want to show us around and uh, since you would be offended well we'd go with you and so the man took him to the basement took all five of them to the basement 
and he quietly opened a door and for these people to be shocked to see that there were 700 people kneeling down in prayer just praying for the service to begin upstairs. And the man looked at these five people and he said, that is the heating point of our church. And the man introduced himself as Charles Haddon Spurgeon to these five people. C.S. Lewis, after his wife Joy lost the battle with cancer, talking about prayer, he said this, I pray because I cannot help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God, it changes me. Prayer doesn't change God, it changes me. I hope God has spoken to you from his word. I know it's a tough prophecy, but uh, I think I've tried my best to make it as simple, but I'm sure God's word has its power to speak to everybody. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this morning's word. Thank you for reminding once again about prayer from the life of your servant, Daniel. Thank you, Lord, for the very powerful prayer that tells us how to pray, that shows us a model that when we, our prayers are rooted in your word, in your character, in an understanding of your character and how you work in the world, you give us deeper insights as we spend time with you and fellowship with you in prayer. Father, it's our prayer this morning that you would give us that kind of a desire and that kind of a conviction to go to you in prayer for everything. As C.S. Lewis said, oh Lord, I cannot help myself but pray because prayer doesn't change God, it changes us. Help us to realize that, oh Lord, that it changes us and it is very, very essential to our Christian life. We want to thank you for your powerful word once again, O oh Lord. We bless your name for the word that you give to us and the word we have in our hands. We submit the rest of the activities into your hands as well. The fellowship and the sisters meeting may all be done to the glory and the honor of your name. In Jesus' name.